we on the air? Can you hear me? I hope so. Warm greetings to all of you, my dear Anawan brothers and sisters. We are uh, gathered once again in this virtual forum, not yet in person, to continue our Anawan life together, our Anawan formation together. Of course, we just got the news today that we are going backward again in the uh, quarantine. We're going to be in GCQ with heightened restrictions starting on Sunday, August 1st, August 1st to 15th. Well, that's the way it is. And we, we praise the Lord. God's will be done. Do not be afraid. We're still waiting for everyone to get connected here. I see we're up to 16 people. I don't know if you can see what I can see, but I can see that there are 16 people with us on this live presentation. Well, anyway, while we're waiting for more people to join, uh, let me share with you or show you our latest upgrade. Um, you know that we do these uh, live presentations in the most amateur possible way. I'm just sitting here talking to the laptop and uh, the video is whatever happens to be the built-in camera of the laptop and the audio happens to be whatever is the built-in microphone. And uh, that's why the uh, video quality is so bad and the audio quality is so bad. Anyway, uh, in order to improve the audio quality, which is really much more important in a forum like this, since you don't have to see my face, uh, but you do have to hear my voice, uh, the office bought a new, um, a new studio quality microphone. Here, I'll show it to you. Here, yeah. Studio quality microphone. I don't know if it makes any difference, but I can't hear it. I tested it out earlier this week, and uh, it doesn't seem to make much difference. But anyway, I hope you can hear clearly the, uh, the audio of this talk. It, it, it does seem to work. If it doesn't work at all, if you can't hear me at all, please uh, call the office or do something to get, get my attention, because I, I can't tell what you can hear, and I don't know what you see. Okay. So now we have more people here. That's good. Almost up to 20. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been four weeks since we gathered in this forum for these uh, formation meetings. And uh, in the middle of the past four weeks, we, uh, meaning two weeks ago, in fact, two weeks ago, Wednesday, yesterday, uh, we lost our dear sister Barbara. She died on July 14. So uh, we that changed our schedule and uh, we gathered as as well as we could, given the quarantine restrictions, we gathered for her wake, for her funeral, uh, for her cremation, and uh, and we had a novena in her honor. And now we are continuing to to mourn and also to rejoice and to give thanks for her life, the gift that her life has been to all of us. Now, among the countless lessons that uh, we learn from Sister Barbara are her insights into prayer, uh, prayer in many different ways, uh, personal prayer, communal prayer, interior prayer, liturgical prayer, all the ways we express the, the depth of of our of our relationship our friendship with god so even though her death has uh, interrupted our our schedule uh, pretty pretty dramatically uh, it has not interrupted the ongoing life of the community and it certainly hasn't interrupted the ongoing journey of prayer that we should all be on the ongoing journey of deepening our relationship of love with God. So, uh, in fact, now that Sister Barbara has gone ahead of us, uh, we can be confident that she will teach us and and help us even more from from the other side. In fact, that's one of the joyful tasks of the communion of saints is to pray for those of us who are here. So we're continuing then our reflections on the Lord's Prayer in light of the new situation that our community has entered. So, so let us begin with prayer, and we don't begin with the Lord's Prayer. We begin with our 
a community's prayer to our Queen Mother Mary and with our prayer to our patron, Saint Joseph. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Queen Mother Mary, we come before you, begging an outpouring of grace upon the whole world. Open the eyes of our hearts with your faith. Draw us deeply into the life of the church as we ponder the mysteries of creation, redemption, and sanctification celebrated in your maternal heart. Lead us into the Eucharistic heart of your Son to drink of the inexhaustible fountain of the divine will. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Prayer to St. Joseph, protector of the Anuim. Beloved St. Joseph, protector of the Anuim, watch over us day and night. Preserve us from occasions of sin and obtain for us purity of soul and body. Grant us a spirit of sacrifice, humility, and courage, a burning love for Jesus in the Eucharist, and a tender love for Mary, our mother. St. Joseph, be with us living, be with us dying, and intercede for us to Jesus, our merciful Savior. Amen. O sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Eucharistic heart of Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Francis, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we gather together once again for the Catechesis on the Lord's Prayer. This is session number six. The title is Father of Us All. It's from the general audience of Pope Francis back in February 13, 2019. Before we turn to the text of the Holy Father, which I hope you have, uh, I hope you have all received the handout. Uh, let's listen to the scripture passage that will be part of his address. This is from Jesus teaching about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew chapter six, verses five through eight. Jesus speaking here. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners so that others may see them. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will repay you. In praying, do not babble like the pagans who think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. I'm just adjusting this new microphone. I hope it doesn't uh, interfere. <laughs> I hope you get better sound now. Anyway, as I said at the beginning, we got a new microphone, studio quality, they call it. So here in this reading from Matthew chapter six, a Jesus tells us to pray in secret and not like the hypocrites and not like the pagans. But the very next verse is the text of the Lord's Prayer, which as we shall see in today's talk is a communal prayer, not a secret personal prayer. So both the personal and the communal uh, aspects of prayer are, are being upheld here. It's almost like a trick question. Uh, the trick question is, is prayer supposed to be uh, secret or public? Is prayer supposed to be personal or communal? And the answer is yes. <laughs> In other words, both. It's both. It's always both. Uh, and, and that's part of why this topic is such a rich one. And we'll be saying more about that in a moment. Now, let's review what we have covered so far in this series. This is the sixth talk. 
in this series of catechesis. And the topics we have covered, or at least the titles we have covered so far, first of all, teach us to pray. That's the root the, 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 the Lord gives us this desire to know how to pray, how to be in union with him. Then the second talk, prayer, a prayer that asks with confidence, confidence based on our relationship with the Father. The third talk was at the center of the Sermon on the Mount. So it was giving, it was a reflection on St. Matthew's uh, setting for the Lord's Prayer. The fourth talk was knock and it will be open to you, which focused on St. Luke's setting for the Lord's Prayer. And then last time, prayer, uh, talk number five was entitled Abba, Father. It was uh, focused on this unique and personal way of relating to God as his child or as his children. Captured in this Aramaic word, Abba, used three times in the New Testament. So that's, uh, that's as far as we've got. Now, and, uh, as, as I noted last time, and as you have probably noticed, the Pope is in no hurry to get to the actual text of the Lord's Prayer. You see, he's not teaching us the Our Father because he doesn't have to teach it to us. We already know it, uh, and we've known it for a long time, and we've had it memorized, and we've said it thousands of times. So he's not teaching us the Our Father. Rather, he's using this series to, to get us to reflect on the roots and principles of prayer and the relationship that prayer establishes and strengthens. Uh, and all of this comes into play, of course, in the Lord's Prayer. Um, today's talk, number six, will feature uh, some aspects of the prayer itself. And so we're going to go a little bit into the prayer. Specifically, he's going to focus on uh, on the you, uh, the, the Father. We address the Father. Uh, your kingdom come, your will be done. And he's going to focus on the we. We're the ones praying. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, forgive us our sins. So that's part of the talk. You might have noticed that. If you, uh, if you have read ahead. But uh, before we get to that, I want to address uh, one idea from last time. So just to go back, if we can go back in quarantine, like we're doing on Sunday, we can certainly go back and, and uh, to a previous talk and get some more fruit out of it. Uh, what I want to focus on is uh, one of the reflection questions from last time, the fifth talk, was about the word or, or the words that we use when we address God? Do we call him Abba? Do we uh, call him Tatai or any familiar term for the relationship of a child with his or her father? And, uh, uh, and uh, I tried this. I mean, I, I put it in the question and then I tried it in my own prayer. And I have to admit, it really doesn't work for me. Uh, I, I respect the point that, the, that Pope Francis is making. It's not simply about the word Abba, or, or, or any particular word that we use. It's about the vital concept of, our, of the close relationship that we have with God as children of a loving father. But in my own experience, the word that I always used in, in speaking to my human father was dad, dad. And I find I can't use that word for God the father. It just doesn't work because uh, the, the word dad or the, uh, the, the name dad it refers in my mind to a particular person, my, my, her, my human father, my earthly father. Uh, it's like a personal name, uh, not, not really a title. And, and I can't use that personal name for anybody else. I, it just doesn't work. Now, I don't think that's a problem. Um, maybe it's a sign of some weakness or something missing in me or in my spiritual life? If so, God will have to enlighten me, or maybe you yourselves can help me uh, see what's missing. But I think it's not a problem because prayer and the language that we use for prayer is very personal. It's, it's, it's never merely a formula or a, or a set word or set of words. It's always personal. Even if, the, even if the formula is very beautiful and very personal, like the word Abba, doesn't mean everybody can get away with using it in his or her own personal relationship with God. So uh, it, since I can't do it, I can't expect anyone else to use any particular word in addressing God. Uh, but we do need a, a personal relationship with God, and we have to be able to talk with him as his children. That, that we, can't, we can't escape, and we shouldn't want to escape. This is it's the very foundation of prayer. Okay, 
let's turn to talk number six here. This is titled, entitled Father of Us All. Dear brothers and sisters, let us continue our journey to learn ever better to pray as Jesus taught us. We must pray as he taught us to pray. <laughs> That's a short uh, paragraph. I don't have really much to say about that. In fact, this is the topic of the whole series, uh, learning to pray, learning to pray as Jesus teaches us. So let's just continue with paragraph number two. He said, when you pray, go quietly into your room, withdraw from the world, and turn to God by calling him Father. Jesus does not want his disciples to be like the hypocrites who pray while standing in the squares to be admired by the people. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. I just read this passage a moment ago. Jesus does not want hypocrisy. True prayer is that done in the secret of the conscience, of the heart, inscrutable, visible only to God, God and I. It shuns falsehood. With God, it is impossible to pretend. It is impossible. There are no tricks that have any power before God. God knows us like this, naked in one's conscience and there can be no pretense. Well, the opposite of hypocrisy, we could say, is authenticity or, or truth or realness. And the Pope points out that Jesus does not want hypocrisy, which would be false prayer. Hypocrisy in prayer would be false prayer. He wants true prayer, which is done in the heart. Now, I'd like to make a couple remarks about what the Pope says here. We all know the experience of being distracted or being not deeply focused in our mind uh, when we're at prayer. Uh, and uh, sometimes this is because we're not really praying. <laughs> maybe we're just lazy. Uh, maybe we're not really making the effort to communicate with God, to talk and listen to God. Uh, prayer is work after all, uh, that, let's face it, like any relationship. But uh, my point here is that distracted or, or less attentive prayer can sometimes still be true prayer uh, if our intention is still to be with God. Like any relationship, there are many ways and many levels of communicating and of being united with a person. We're not, uh, relationships are not limited to face-to-face, uh, eyeball-to-eyeball, serious conversation. That's not the only way we relate to people, and it's not the only way we relate to God. Uh, when, when we're with people whom we love, we walk together, we work together, we, we joke together, or we play. <laughs> Sometimes we're silent together. That's part of a real relationship, and the same with God. Same with God. So don't narrow down your idea of, of, of true prayer uh, to, to what is most solemn and, and formal and focused. Uh, no. That, and, and don't judge all your other prayers to be mere hypocrisy. No. <laughs> no. Okay. So just to set aside that concern that you might, we might uh, take this idea of what, uh, what the Pope says about true prayer and, and uh, judge all our prayers as being not true prayer. No. <laughs> Uh, be, be flexible, just uh, I, uh, identify or evaluate prayer in light of the relationship we have with God. Now, the other point I want to make uh, here is that we can see from what the Pope says how prayer is not simply what we do. It's not something we do. We're in this activity with God. We're not, we're not just talking at God or, or talking about God. Uh, notice what the Pope says here. God knows us like this, naked in one's conscience, and there can be no pretense. So we should not erase from our idea of prayer this deep knowledge of God, this, this, this fact that God knows us. Our understanding of prayer includes this. Otherwise, we're just talking to ourselves or thinking about ourselves. And Jesus himself says this in the passage I read a moment ago. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. He knows us. He sees what we're doing. He, he hears what we're thinking already. 
even when we are being hypocrites or, or pagans, he, he sees through that too. So that, that we have to acknowledge as part of our relationship with him. He knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. At the root of the dialogue with God, there is a silent dialogue, like the glance between two people in love. Man's gaze meets God's. And this is prayer. Looking at God and allowing yourself to be looked upon by God. This is prayer. But Father, the, 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 the questioner, <laughs> but Father, I, I do not say any words. Look at God and let yourself be looked upon by him. It is a prayer, a beautiful prayer. Now, this idea of silence, or even this term, silent dialogue, uh, may seem like a contradiction. Uh, how can you have a dialogue if it's silent? Can you have a silent conversation? Can you have a silent pondering group, a sharing group? Well, there's no contradiction. If we see where the Pope is pointing, he's pointing to the deeper dimension of prayer the deeper level of communication, the intimate relationship that is being acknowledged without saying anything, without it being necessary to say anything. This is, this is a mutual gaze. God looks at us, we look at him. We look at him, he looks at us. Uh, this mutual gaze, uh, for me, I think is perhaps best done in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. So if you go to a, a Eucharistic adoration uh, where, the, where the Blessed Sacrament is exposed, or even if you just go into a ch church or a chapel where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved in the tabernacle, uh, you, you can, it, it's enough simply to sit there or to kneel there or prostrate yourself there uh, without saying anything. It's enough to sit or kneel in silence. It's okay to say words, I, don't get me wrong. It's of course okay to say words to God, yes. Uh, but we should also realize it's not always necessary to be talking all the time. There is an interior looking and being looked at, uh, gazing and being gazed upon, and that's enough. As, as the Pope says, that's how lovers are sometimes. Um, they don't always have to speak. Now, I know opportunities to visit the Blessed Sacrament are very, very limited now. Our parish here is locked down, strictly locked down. It won't even be open till next week. Uh, and even when it's open, there's no uh, adoration chapel and there's no exposition. No, but there is, a, the, the Eucharist is there in the tabernacle. So, but if, if most, most of you who are watching right now can't go to the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, it only means we have to find other ways to this silent dialogue the Pope is talking about, this beautiful prayer, uh, other ways to find, uh, find ourselves in the presence of God in our own private spaces. Paragraph number three, yet although the disciples' prayer may be completely confidential, it is never lacking in intimacy. In the secret of the conscience, a Christian does not leave the world outside the door of his room, but carries people and situations the problems, many things in his heart. I bring them all to prayer. Now, to be honest, I don't really understand the first sentence of this paragraph number three. Um, it seems to set up a contrast between confidentiality and intimacy, which makes no sense to me. I'm assuming this is a weak translation uh, from the Italian. But uh, so I'm just going to skip over that first sentence. The rest of the paragraph, though, is clear. It's clear that he's saying that being alone with God does not mean being cut off from the world. Uh, the secrecy of the dialogue that we have, and the silent dialogue that we have with God, is not a rejection of everything else that God has made a part of our life. Yes, we reject something. We reject sin, for sure, and we reject useless distractions as much as possible. They don't belong to the dialogue, but we don't have to eliminate all our joys and sorrows and all our hopes and fears. We don't have to eliminate our loved ones. We don't have to eliminate the, our concerns for 
the world, the problems of the world. No, that becomes part of our prayer. This pandemic is a great example of it. Every day we pray for the end of the pandemic and we should. Don't give up on prayer. Okay, so uh, his point here is that we're not uh, leaving the world at the door and, and closing everything out, not in the absolute sense. It's different, you know, the Buddhist tradition, uh, Buddhist meditation is largely a matter of emptying oneself, emptying, creating a kind of inner void, uh, a nothing, an inner nothingness in order to find peace, to find uh, stability, to, to find an inner stillness uh, that is not troubled by the, by the, the tumultuous voices of the passions, this sort of thing. Christian prayer is not empty. We're not emptying ourselves. In fact, a Christian prayer is an expansion of the heart to be able to take in more so that our heart becomes more and more like the heart of God himself. See, it's completely different than, than Buddhist meditation or other, other forms of, of uh, non-Christian meditation. It's true that we empty ourselves. Yes, we empty ourselves. There is uh, self-denial for sure. But it's not for the sake of being empty. That's not the goal. Rather, it's in order to be filled. We empty ourselves of what does not belong to our relationship with God in order to be filled with God, in order to be filled with love. A praying person can carry more in his or her heart. Not, not more of what I want and not, not a greater emphasis on my self-will, it means more love. A praying person has more love, more focus on the other, more focus on God and on neighbor. Number four, there is a striking absence in the text of the Lord's Prayer. Were I to ask you what the striking absence in the text of the Lord's Prayer is, it would not be easy to answer. A word is missing, everyone think. What is missing from the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> it's the perfect prayer. What can be missing? Think, what is missing? One word. One word which in our times, perhaps always, everyone holds in great consideration. What is the missing word in the Lord's Prayer that we pray every day? To save time, I will tell you, the word I is missing. I is never said. And Jesus teaches us to pray with you on our lips, because Christian prayer is a dialogue. Blessed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Not my name, my kingdom, my will, not I, it is no good. And then it moves on to we, the entire second part of the Our Father uses the first person plural, the we, give us our daily bread, forgive us our sins, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Even the most basic of man's requests, such as that of having food to satisfy hunger, are all in the plural. Plural, first person plural. Kami, bigyan mo kami, that's what we say. In Christian prayer, no one asks for bread for themselves. Give me bread today. No, give us bread. It is asked for all, for all the world's poor. We must not forget this. The word I is missing. We pray by using you and we. It is a good lesson from Jesus. Do not forget this. Well, I don't have to explain anything about this paragraph number four. The Pope's point is very clear. True prayer is never that of an isolated I, a colon. It's never that way. True prayer. So the Lord's Prayer focuses first on God himself, our Father. That's the you part. You part. Nalan mo, kaharayan mo, panglo mo. It's all about you, Father. And then there's the first part. And then that it unites uh, with others in making our petitions to God. That's the we part. There is no I part. Have you ever noticed this? Have you ever heard of this? I, it's funny because I don't remember this ever coming up. Uh, I can't remember ever thinking of it or, or, or reading about it, even though it's so obvious and so basic. 
but there's no I in the in the Lord's Prayer. Now, this idea does not originate with Pope Francis. In doing research for this series, I have run across this insight in some other commentaries. So maybe everybody knows it except me. I don't know. But <laughs> I think it's quite striking that it's so basic and yet might not be acknowledged. The Pope here is teaching a very a fundamental lesson about prayer. It's never all about me. It's never just about me. Even when we are praying for something very personal, very secret, it's still in the context of our relationship with others before God, the family. Now, isn't it striking? Jesus tells us to go to the secret room and pray privately. That makes it sound like it's very, very personal. It sounds like an I. I'm going to my room to pray for myself. That's what it sounds like. But in the very next sentence, he teaches us this prayer using only the you and the we. Balance between what is communal, what is personal, or not just balance one against the other, but they're together. Uh, what is most personal to us is together with what is the need of us all. Uh, let me uh, throw in here a side issue. It's related, uh, but it's not, uh, not directly. It's a side issue. You might have heard uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, some of this raging controversy regarding the traditional Latin mass. Uh, two weeks ago, Pope Francis issued a very strong crackdown on the use of the old mass. Um, it was surprisingly harsh, in fact, a complete reversal of what Pope Benedict had done. And uh, now there's a lot of attention, uh, a lot of focus on this uh, form of the Mass, the Old Latin Mass. I'm not that familiar with it myself. Uh, this this uh, doesn't directly affect us. But there is a lot of discussion now about the, the Latin Mass. Or what, why is the Pope against it? What's wrong? What's, what's so bad about it? And people are rising up to, to defend it. Well, all that, that's a discussion for another day, perhaps. But uh, one of the features of the old Latin Mass is that the Lord's Prayer, the Pater Noster, is not prayed by everyone in the congregation together as we do in the newer form of the Mass. No, it, 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 it was or is prayed by the priest alone. I don't know if he says it out loud. I, I, I say I'm not that familiar with it, but it's said by the priest alone on behalf of the people. And the people remain silent during the Our Father. Only the last line is said aloud, uh, but, but uh, how does it go? But deliver us from evil. I uh, said, libera nos a malo, but, but deliver us from evil. And I think, I might not be right about this, but I think only the, the altar boy said that. So the priest says the whole Our Father, the altar boy says the last line, everybody else remains silent. So in that form, it's very clear that the priest is not simply praying for himself alone. The priest is all in, in the mass in the liturgy. The priest is always praying either for the people or with the people. I mean, never praying for himself alone. Well, not never. There are some private prayers that the priest says, but the Our Father is not one of them. But it might seem in the old form, it might seem that all the people are praying for themselves alone because they're silent. In the, in, in the current form of the Mass, everyone is praying aloud together. Clearly, that's communal prayer. But there's no observance in that setting of what Jesus says about praying in secret, So, in, which in this context is the silent, silent dialogue. So you can see the pros and the cons of, of the two uh, forms of the Mass, the older and the newer, uh, trying to balance the communal nature of the Lord's Prayer, the you and the we that the Pope is talking about here in number four, and the, and the requirement that we pray in secret, which could be done in silence. Or just an interesting thing about the evolution of the liturgy. Now let's return to the Pope's thoughts here, number five. Why? Why is there no room for individualism in the dialogue with God? There is no display of our own problems as if we were the only ones suffering in the world. No narrowing down just to our problems. We might feel that way, and of course we have a right to express things that way, but we should know we're not the only ones suffering in the world. And, 
and our father is not concerned just about us, although he is concerned about us personally. There's no display of our own problems as if we were the only ones suffering in the world. There's no prayer raised to God that is not the prayer of a community of brothers and sisters. We, we are a community. We are brothers and sisters. We are a people who pray. We, even when we are praying alone for ourselves. Uh, today is the feast of, not only the feast of St. Martha, but the feast of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, which I think is a beautiful, uh, uh, expansion of the feast because it's it, it brings out this we quality or this family quality to the spiritual life. We are brothers and sisters like Martha, Mary, and Lazarus are brothers and sisters, siblings. Anyway, we have to set that aside for now. Once a prison chaplain asked me a question, tell me, Father, what is the opposite of I? And naively, I said you. This is the start of war. The opposite of I is us. Where there is peace, all are together. I received a beautiful lesson from that priest. Now, <laughs> it's a good thing to reflect on. And this is, one of the, this is one of the ways Pope Francis is good. It gets us thinking. You could argue about what is the opposite of I. Uh, maybe all of us would have answered just like the Pope did. Uh, we would have answered, you and I would have. If someone says, what's the opposite of I, I would have said you. <laughs> and it doesn't mean it's wrong. And these are off the top of your head, uh, you know, word association uh, things like the, the, the tests that the psychologists used to use. Maybe they still do, but they used to say, OK, what? tell me the first word that comes into your mind when I say a word. So uh, the, the, the therapist says, says boy, and you say girl. <laughs> he says dark, you say light or something like that. Say I. You, <laughs> it just comes out that way. There's no right answer or wrong answer. It's just varying patterns of thought. And that's why it's good to reflect on why did I say you? Uh, why did I say girl? Why did I say dark or light? Someone could say, if, 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 the, if I say boy, you might say man. That's a legitimate word association. Uh, if you say uh, light, you might say sun <laughs> or moon, or stars. Right? There's lots of ways. Uh, to associate. So the point of the Pope and the, the lesson he learned from this prison chaplain, the lesson that he's passing on to us, is that contrasting I and you all the time is the basis of conflict, a war. That's the basis of war. <laughs> to say I against you, you against me, that's a that's, uh, war. But to shift from, from I to we, I to us, opens the way to peace. We can be united. We can be together here. We together. That one word unites us instead of instead of setting us on opposite poles of a conflict. Maybe I can make a rather obvious application uh, of this taken from current affairs. I don't think you'll mind if I bring this up because every Filipino is rejoicing over the victory of Heidi Lynn Diaz. Uh, she's the golden girl of the moment because of her historic Olympic gold medal. Now, let, let, let's think about this a little. Uh, she's, she's the center of attention. But you might have noticed, at least the way it looks to me, she's not all that caught up in herself, in her personal achievement. I won a gold medal. Yes, she's celebrating she won the gold medal. But she's very quick to thank God. She's very quick to thank her coaches and her trainers, and there's a lot of them, she's quick to thank her family and acknowledge the sacrifices that they also have made. She, she acknowledges her supporters, benefactors, team members. From what I see, and that's very little, but she's quite admirable in seeing the we quality of what she has done, uh, the we quality of her, her victory. She seems to be quite strikingly conscious uh, that her victory is a victory for the whole country. And this is for the Philippines. And that seems to be how everyone interprets it. And I think it's right. And that's why I think it, it, it applies to this point of the Pope about being a, a we. Every Filipino can say, I'm happy because of what she has done, because that's a way of saying, we are happy because, what, because of what we have done. It's, it's a valid way of, uh, of, of seeing 
this is a communal, a communal joy. I think it's a good practical uh, uh, current lesson, uh, uh, making the point that we're not individuals alone. Now, thinking about Heidi Lindy is, I mean, <laughs> she's a weightlifter. It's hard to imagine a, 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 a sport that is more individual than weightlifting. <laughs> you, you do it alone. One person picks up one barbell, one lift at a time, and, uh, and that's it. And they train alone, at least that's how we would not think of it. They compete as individuals, and so it seems. But as, as we reflect on this victory of Heidi Lynn Diaz, uh, we see there's much more to it than meets the eye. It's not just something that she did or something that she has accomplished. It, it, it encompasses a whole community, in fact, a whole country. Not only that, it, uh, she's become famous all around the world as the first Filipino to win a gold medal. So in some ways, the world rejoices to see a victory like this. Okay, good lesson. Let's get back to the Pope. Uh, paragraph number six here. In prayer, a Christian bears all the difficulties of the people who live beside him. Just to pause on that, uh, bearing the difficulties, you could say, learning from, from Heidi Lynn Diaz, you could say that every Christian is a spiritual weightlifter, bearing all the difficulties of others. So a Christian bears all the difficulties of the people who live beside him. When night falls, he tells God about the suffering he has come across that day. He sets before him, before God, many faces, friends, and even those who are hostile. He does not shoo them away as dangerous distractions. It again, goes back to the point we made earlier, and we're not in our prayer, we're not emptying ourselves of everything that's part of life. We're not closing the door on the whole world. We carry it in our hearts, we carry our loved ones in our hearts, and even our enemies in our hearts. See, very often, what what we might at first think of as distractions are in fact prayer intentions or should be prayer intentions, things that we are carrying in our hearts that we should be lifting up to God in prayer, not dismissing, not, not shooing away. Okay. If you do not realize that there are many people suffering around you, if you are not moved by the tears of the poor, if you are not accustomed, no, if you are accustomed to everything, meaning comfortable with everything, then it means your heart, what is it like? Withered? No, worse. It is made of stone. Problem of hardness of heart. This comes up very often in the Bible, hardness of hearts, stony hearts. In this case, it is good to implore the Lord to touch us with his spirit and soften our heart. Soften my heart, Lord. It is a beautiful prayer. Lord, soften my heart so that I may understand and take on all the problems and all the sufferings of others. He says this is a beautiful prayer. Do you think it's beautiful? You think it's beautiful to understand and take on all the problems and all the sufferings of others. You see, to many people, that sounds like a psychological disorder. It sounds like a messiah complex. It sounds like someone who, no, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately misinterpreting what the Pope is saying, but a lot of critics of religion, this is what people say, you know, uh, you're just trying to put yourself in the middle of everybody else's life. You're burdening yourself yourselves with things that are none of your business. That is a psychological disorder, if that's what you're doing. Uh, if you're making the world revolve around you, uh, that's a problem. Prayer is exactly not that. <laughs> Prayer is not about building up the I, putting the our I in the middle of everybody's life. That is not prayer. Uh, prayer is to allow our heart to be expanded by God's love, which and God's love and does encompass everyone and bear everyone's suffering. That's exactly what love does. Now, since I'm talking to Anuim people, I can make this uh, connection to our own community prayer to our sorrowful mother. I mean, 
probably pray this prayer every day, Sorrowful Mother Mary, uh, which includes the idea of, of taking on sufferings. So we say, Mary, make our hearts like yours. Good enough, we say, well, that's a great idea. We want our hearts to be like Mary's heart. Our heart is immaculate, our heart is beautiful. But then we say, uh, Mary, make our hearts like yours, altars of reparation for the afflictions and offenses against your son. <laughs> Do we know what we're asking for there? Our, our nature says, well, who, who wants afflictions? Who, who wants to make reparation? What's that all about? And then the prayer continues. Help us to bear our crosses, uniting our sufferings with his for the redemption of the world. We could add, uh, uh, adding the point that the, that the Pope is focused on here, we could add, uniting our sufferings and those of others with his for the redemption of the world. So, so this idea of prayer is to make us more Christ-like, more Mary-like too, if you want to add that point. Of course, she's the most Christ-like of all of his disciples, but prayer is to make us more Christ-like, make our heart like his heart, like her heart. Christ did not pass unscathed beside the miseries of the world each time he perceived loneliness, physical or spiritual pain, he felt a strong sense of compassion, like a mother's womb. See the Marian dimension, the Pope even brings it out. Oh, what? Mother's womb, that's the spiritual motherhood of Mary right there, the sorrowful mother, bearing and even uh, undergoing labor pains for the life, spiritual life of others, a Marian dimension. And that's, what I, that's why I mentioned that. This feeling compassion, let us not forget this word that is so Christian, feeling compassion, is one of the key words of the gospel. It is what inspires the good Samaritan to approach the wounded man by the roadside, unlike others who are hard of heart. Here he brings up this contrast, this stony heart, this hardness of heart on one hand, and compassion on the other hand. Hardness of heart prevents true prayer. Hardness of heart also prevents compassion for our neighbor. And that, that was the condition in the, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the condition of the priest and the Levite. The priest and the Levite in that parable, I'm sure you know it, they are exposed as hypocrites. Hypocrites, the very thing that God does not want. See, see a, a compassionate heart, as opposed to a hard heart, a compassionate heart is capable both of prayer and of service to our neighbor. And a hard heart is capable of neither one. So it's, it's the same, same quality that makes love of God and love of neighbor possible for us. Compassion, love. Number seven, we can ask ourselves, when I pray, Am I open to the cries of many people near and far? Or do I think of prayer as a type of anesthesia in order to be more at peace? I'm just tossing the question out there. Each of you can answer to yourself. Well, I think it's a great, good question. As you might have looked ahead, looked at the bottom of your handout, I, I put these exact questions, uh, I, I placed them there for our own reflection and sharing. Uh, when I pray, am I open to the cries of, of many people near and far? Or do I think of prayer as a type of anesthesia? In such case, I would be the victim of a terrible misunderstanding. Of course, mine would no longer be a Christian prayer. So if we don't, if we don't have compassion, we don't have Christian prayer. Because that we that Jesus taught us prevents me from being at peace by myself and makes me feel responsible for and compassion for my brothers and sisters. You see, this idea of prayer as a type of anesthesia, it, it's, what, a, what a concept that is. I mean, <laughs> and this is what critics of religion sometimes accuse us of, 
escaping from reality. They, they say, well, you, you, you go off to an unreal world that you're comfortable with so that you can avoid the real world that, that has real problems and they make us uncomfortable. Well, actually, that is a danger. I mean, people could do that. It's, it, 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 people could be escaping into a fantasy world. But as is very clear from what the Pope says here, that's not prayer. Escape into a fantasy world or escape into a, a personal concern is not prayer. We do have to withdraw from the world. We do have to withdraw from from problems, we have to withdraw from busyness and think of Martha in today's gospel, no? anxious, anxious, anxious and upset about many things. We, we do have to step out of that uh, frenzied activity. We do have to retreat at times. We do need silence at times, yes. But it's not escape in the absolute sense. It's not, it's not running away from the world. It's not selfishness. It's, it's to allow a recharge of our love. It's a going to God, not going away from God. Number eight, there are people who seemingly do not seek God, but Jesus asks us to pray for them too, because God seeks these people more than anyone else. Think of the lost sheep. No, God seeks them. He loves them. Therefore, we must do the same when we pray. Jesus did not come for the healthy, but for the sick, for sinners. That is for everyone, because whoever thinks he is healthy in reality is not. <laughs> when I hear that kind of language, it makes me think of Father Francis. Uh, if you ever heard him preach, he would, he would pierce the heart with lines like this. If you think you're healthy, in reality, you're not. <laughs> really, here I am. I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, identify myself as a sick man, but if I don't, well, then I'm really sick. If we work for justice, we do not feel we are better than others. The Father makes the Son rise on the good and on the evil. The Father loves everyone. Let us learn from God, who is always good to everyone, opposite to us, who are able to be good only to certain people with someone we like. So we have to learn God's ways, not our natural ways, the ways of compassion, not the ways of hardness of heart. Number nine. Brothers and sisters, saints and sinners, we are all brothers and sisters loved by the same Father. That's why the title of this talk is Father of us all, all of us sinners, saints and sinners. And in the evening of life, we will be judged on love, on how we have loved. That expression comes especially from St. John of the Cross. In the evening of life, we will be judged on love. Love, not merely sentimental love, but compassionate and tangible love, according to the gospel rule, do not forget it, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So says the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Conclusion of his talk. See, the Pope ends this reflection on prayer with a statement about love. Prayer and love, prayer and compassion have to go together. That's what he's saying. Either we have both or we have neither. So he concludes this reflection not with a rule about prayer and, and not with quoting the Lord's Prayer. In fact, he seems to have left the text of the Lord's Prayer behind again. Rather, he concludes with what he calls the Lord's gospel rule, what we do to our least brother we do to Jesus. It's another rich reflection on the spiritual life, another reflection from a real Jesuit spiritual director, Pope Francis. So we give thanks to God for this opportunity. I hope this is fruitful for you. I leave you with uh, some questions. Actually, I just picked out three key lines from the Pope's talk, something to focus on in your own prayer and in the discussion in the, sh in the small groups. The first one comes from paragraph number five. There is no prayer raised to God that is not the prayer of a community of brothers and sisters. No prayer that is not the prayer of a community. We could put it in the positive sense if you want to, if it makes it easier to reflect on. You could say every prayer raised to God is the prayer of a community 
of brothers and sisters. Again, this is, this is one of the central points today. That's why I picked it out. And it's reflected in the title, Father of Us All. Well, the question is, what does this mean to you? How does this principle on prayer influence your own personal prayer? How, does your, how do you see your own personal prayer as the prayer of a community of brothers and sisters? Okay, that's number one. Number two, Pope Francis twice in this talk mentions a beautiful prayer. Once in paragraph two and once in paragraph number six. One is the, the silent dialogue. He says it's the silent dialogue is a beautiful prayer. That's at the end of paragraph number two, the prayer of looking at God and him looking at us. The other one, uh, the other example of the, of the beautiful prayer is, Lord, soften my heart so that I may understand and take on all the problems and all the suffering of others. So this is in the middle of that very important paragraph number six in this talk. In the middle of paragraph six is this beautiful prayer. Well, the question is, do you think these are beautiful prayers? Do you think silent dialogue and asking the Lord to soften your heart so that you can take on the suffering of others is beautiful. What is beautiful about them? Do you pray like this? Good to reflect on, good to share on. And then the third question, this comes from the beginning of paragraph number seven. When, I, and I already mentioned this, uh, when I pray, am I open to the cries of many people near and far, or do I think of prayer as a type of anesthesia? in order to be more at peace. I'm just tossing the question out there. Each of you can answer to himself. So that's why I'm giving it to you because the Pope says, each of you can answer this question. When have you misunderstood or misused prayer as a type of anesthesia, a kind of a deadening or a kind of escape? When have you experienced prayer making you more open to others, more willing to bear their burdens. Good things to reflect on. So take some time for prayer. I guess we went a little over time. Sorry about that. But <laughs> these are rich talks. Take some time for prayer. Don't immediately go to the sharing groups. Reflect a little bit. And then uh, the leaders can get organized the groups that have been listed in the Viber page. There are five groups I saw, and there are 36 names. I see here 30, 31 people are live with us. That's pretty good. So. I know some people can't join the group, some people can't connect, some people are, have other commitments, but I hope you can, can uh, take advantage of reflecting on these things together and, uh, and sharing on this rich topic together. Let's help each other apply the, these lessons to our own lives. This is part of community life after all. We have communal prayer and we have a shared life as well. Okay, uh, you saw the update on the prayer chain mentioned specifically Susan. I hope you will also continue to pray for my brother. He, ha he is still in crippling pain. He's been under evaluation uh, for some seven weeks now of tests and, and scans and consultations and treatments. And they don't even have really a very good diagnosis yet. So I, my brother is really in need of your prayer. And I'm grateful if you will pray for him. Uh, the birthday celebrants for this month, we're already at the end of the month. The uh, Birthday celebrants for July, one of them's today. One of them's today, I'll ring. Uh, first of all, there was uh, on July 16, Sister Mendy, happy, happy birthday again to you, Mendy. Yesterday, Filian, her birthday, July 28, and today, I'll ring. Happy birthday to all of you, especially to Filian and I'll ring. Uh, and then, since we're at the end of the month, we don't have to look very far ahead. In fact, just to Sunday, August 1st, and we will, uh, the day when we go backward again in the GCQ with increased restrictions, we will also celebrate on that day the birthday of our sister Eva. So happy birthday to you as well. Okay, I'll stop talking. I'll give you a blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.